we were discussing about light and sound when we uh, broke for lunch. If you still remember after that gourmet lunch, pizza and pizza. Did you like that lunch? Oh, yeah. How many of you? Thank you, thank you. Now that we had enough food for the body, we can have some for the soul. We were talking about light and sound, how they emerge in inner experience as manifestation of the same word. The same word, the same sound current, the same power, the same origin of consciousness, if I may put it like that, manifests during our spiritual experience in the form of light and sound. The other senses fall off by the wayside. And they are important, sense of touch, taste and smell are important and establish a deeper reality at the physical level and at the astral level. But as you go above the astral level into causal and spiritual levels and to the highest forms of consciousness, these senses become the most coarse and are left behind. But the sense of sight and sound, the sense of light and resonance, vibration of both light and sound continues. Therefore, as we move on the right direction in our inner journey, we get the experience of light and sound. Sometimes, some individuals, because of their background, because of their karma, their sun scars, their accumulated attitudes, see more of light, some see more of sound. But light, being a visual experience, catches our eye more easily than sound. So many people, even in initial stages of their meditation, may see flickers of light, some streaks of light, some stars piercing through. And eventually, a big white light or colored light waterfalls made of colored light that they are flowing over like it's water. All those beautiful colored and white scenes of light that you see inside are coming from the same source. And that shows that we are moving, being drawn to ourselves. In, death, in the experience of death and near death, we also see signs of similar light and detachment from the body. That we take our visual power away from ourselves and we can see that the body was dying, dying and not us. We are still conscious. And still we can see what has been variously described as the tunnel of light or the light coming from a direction or angelic presences that there are some beings present who we may not be able to see or we may be able to see. So these experiences are all experiences of withdrawing the attention from the body, almost like vacating the body of consciousness and moving on to another form which has a longer life than this body. And this was the kind of experience that you referred to yesterday. So these experiences only convince us that our own reality is more permanent than what we see here. And this body is not as permanent as our own reality. To go to our own reality, to follow the spiritual path, is to attain immediate permanency. Because you can experience death while living. You can experience what would happen if you were to die. And therefore, you are no longer afraid of death. One of the things that happens by this uh, uh, meditation or spiritual path is you lose the fear of death. After you lose the fear of death, you also lose all other fears. Strangely, fear is, a, fear is an emotion in which we get frightened by our mind, our own mind, telling us who knows what's there. Nobody is afraid of anything else except what may happen. Who knows? Fear is coming from not knowing. Nobody has got fear by knowing. People think that we saw, uh, some people used to tell me, we saw a lion in the forest and we were frightened. So we made some studies in the Kamau Hills in India. They, they were the man, hunt, man killers, man killing leopards and the tigers are there. And uh, people went with fear. But when the tiger came in front of them, they were not afraid. Fear was overcome by a desire to escape, desire to overcome the situation, a different emotion. 
overcomes fear when we know. But when we don't know, it is pure fear. So fear is generally caused by ignorance. And once we know what death is, and we are all afraid of death till we know what death is, the fear of death goes, lots of other fears also go. And once we go to a higher stage of consciousness above the mind, into pure spirituality, all fears go. Because then we discover fear is nothing but a device by the mind to keep us absorbed. Fear and doubt both are created by the mind and the devices to distract us. Therefore, yes, therefore, this practice of uh, spiritual meditation helps us in this world and also helps us in the life beyond. Yesterday in the lecture, a question was asked if the assumption that the ideal situation is the real situation and the material creation is not real. Supposing that assumption is given up and we say the world is real, everything is real and we are just trying to make believe. that This is all a make believe. When I was at Harvard, a Harvard professor put this question to me that uh, uh, supposing uh, uh, what you are saying turns out to be just a suggestion, a very strong suggestion to yourself. And as a result of suggestion, you start seeing lights, you start hearing sounds, and you start having the experience of flying, and you start feeling good, and you start feeling happy, and on top of the world, as you have been doing, by that time I had done this, being on top of the world for about maybe 45 years, 40 years, <laughs> now I have done it for 65 years. So I had done it for a long time, so he couldn't just explain it away as good wishing or good co coincidence, I had done it too long. And now I've done it even longer to feel like being on top of the world, always happy, no problems. If you can get all this just by a power of suggestion, don't you think it could be a good psychological, psychological trick to play upon yourself? I agreed. I said, yes. I agree. It is a good suggestion. It worked. But then I said, don't forget the metaphysical question I am going to raise now. You told me it's a suggestion that worked and I agreed with you. Now I tell you what you are watching in this world is also suggestion. Can you do anything about it? The truth is this also is a suggestion. How did the mind create this except by suggestion? This so-called real world that you are assuming to be real is also created by the same suggestion, the power of suggestion to the mind like my inner world was created. That doesn't matter. So, the point I am making is, this method of spiritual meditation and living a spiritual life not only gives us great confidence, love, joy, happiness, it transforms us and transforms our life. Now, some of you have been uh, coming to my lectures for some time. Has anybody come for a long enough time, say a few years? Please raise your hand if any one of you has come. You have. How many of you have actually felt that there has been a transformation just by following this? All of you? How many have not felt like that? This is a 100% result. <laughs> I've never seen any, any course of studies which gives 100% success. Here is 100% success. What happened? What was the assumption? Is not of that consequence. We can keep on arguing all the time. Is it real? How can we believe it? Is this philosophy right? Is the other system of meditation better? Is this better? Is this master the real one? Is that master the real one? Are we being fooled by somebody? Is this person a saint or a con man? We can keep on this kind of a debate and investigation for life. And then we die and are reborn to start the investigation again. What good is that? It's a waste of time. It is like the story of the man who fell into a well. You heard that before. A man fell into the well and uh, he couldn't get out. He tried his best. He couldn't find. He didn't have enough steps to go out. He moaned and he groaned and he was feeling sad in the well. He didn't know how to get out. A passerby, hearing the moans and groans of this man in the well, came and he found the man was trapped in the well. He brought a rope and lowered the rope and he said, come out. The man who was in the well, as an aside, I might tell you, was a professor of philosophy at some time. <laughs> the man in the well said, before I 
pick up the rope and come out, I want to know how I fell into the well. That man said, don't you think it will be better if you came out of the well, then we'll, while we are walking, we can talk about how you fell? No, unless I know how I fell into the well, and I am sure why I will not again fall into the well, why should I catch the rope? Secondly, how am I sure that when I catch the rope, you will pull me out? You might drop me in the middle. First answer all these questions. I want to be sure. And the man outside said, have some faith. Have some trust. I am lowering the rope to you. All right, I'll tie the rope with something and you climb on your own. And I have come to help you because you are moaning and groaning in this well. Once you are outside, we'll discuss everything. He said, no, I must first be satisfied. You must give all the answers to my questions. I won't proceed. After a while, the man outside said, I left my job to come and help you and you don't want to be saved. Okay, he left the room. Okay, you stay in the well. Walked away. Sometimes we act like this. We get opportunities to get out of our state. And we are so busy examining the pros and cons of how it happened, the process, the procedure, and our state remains the same. And we don't get out. We don't take a chance in getting out and stay in a worse state. That is how our state can become because of our so-called intellectual mind, which wants answers to questions more than it wants reality. There are many people who would love to hear nice answers to questions. When I found this trick that people want answers to questions, I prepared some very bright answers. So in the beginning, I used to give talks and give such good answers, interspersed with a lot of jokes. They said, boy, he has, he knows the truth. After five years, I would meet them. They would ask the same question. I said, but I answered that one. Said, but the answer was so good, we would like to hear again. <laughs> And I said, what about your spiritual progress? Oh, we haven't done any meditation. They were busy in the game of amusement, amusing themselves with questions and answers and doing nothing real. So this is not spiritual path. The spiritual path is to go within personally, not wait. Once uh, a very uh, philosophical man who was a follower of one of the saints in India, he took a friend of his who came from the countryside. You know, hillbilly. We call it hillbilly. He was a he was an Indian hillbilly. And didn't know much, no university, no college, nothing. And that boy came, and this professor said, "I am going to take you to the discourse of a perfect saint. Perfect mystic is in town. He is giving a discourse. I'll take you there." So the hillbilly said, "That's great. I'll come along." So he went with the professor's cousin, and when they were in the audience, the mystic said, "The truth is within you." Put your attention behind the eyes and go within. The hillbilly got up and walked. And professor ran after him. What are you doing? The discourse has just started. He said, but he said, go within. What good is my staying here and listening to more? First, I should go home, go within, and then come back to listen to more. Professor suddenly realized he was a practical man. All his time, he had heard hundreds of discourses and never tried to go within. And here is this hillbilly fellow. He comes and straight away catches the point and runs after the first line in the discourse. The truth is very simple. This is a practical path. It's a path of self-realization. It's not a path just for discussion and amusement. A man knocked at the door of a Swami, a yogi, Indian yogi. And the yogi said, who's there? No answer. Another knock. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Swami said, who are you? No answer. Tuck, tuck, tuck. He said, why don't you say who you are? Then the man spoke. If I knew that, why would I knock at your door? <laughs> that was the whole purpose. He said, I am knocking at your door only to know this. The moment I know this, I'll go back home and practice. Another story is told to make the same thing clear. How people waste their time in running from place to place, library to library. A woman was searching for something in a small village, small town in India, where there are no lights, only the street lights are there. Small street lights, they light up at night and they switch them off in the morning. Not electric light, candle light, some kind of an oil wick lamp light. Woman was searching for something and a young man came and seeing the old woman busy searching, he said, ma'am, have you lost something? Can I help you? 
And the lady said, yes, I was uh, sewing something with my sewing needle, the little needle that has fallen off and I can't find it. So I'm looking for it. And the young man said, may I help you to find it? He said, of course. So they both started looking for it. After a while, the young man said, ma'am, do you remember where you dropped it? She said, yes, I dropped it in my house. He said, then why are you looking for it here? She said, I have no light there. <laughs> we know the truth is lost inside us. We close our eyes. It is dark. So we go to the workshops and we go to churches, temples, libraries, universities. And now don't go inside because it is dark there. That's our story. The points I'm making with these little stories is that this is a very simple way. Go within personally. Not by anybody else's experience. Don't say, I know it is the truth because so and so is a saint. He went in. That's his experience. You acquire your own experience by going with it. That's why I emphasize the, emphasize the importance of practice in this part. And you will notice that as you change your lifestyle, eat better food, be a vegetarian, don't uh, consume alcoholic uh, drinks, don't take drugs, lead a good life. And when you and be kind and ha happy with people around you and uh, uh, put yourself in the other person's position, if you can't love people, pretend that you love. <laughs> it's very easy to pretend. If you know the definition of love, then it becomes easy. The definition of love is identification with another. If you can meet a person in your life and forget who you are, assume you are that other person. Think you are that other person. Think you are in the position of that other person. Think you are thinking like that other person. Pretend you are that person. After a while, that person will be so happy with you. You never experienced it before. This is just a pretender love. Then you will see love coming back to you. You will fall in love yourself. Love is identification. Love is not an ego game. I love you. What have you done for me lately? It's not something that you claim. Love is, love is the only experience in this physical world that puts our ego aside. Nothing else puts the ego aside. Meditation makes one wild with ego. I do so many hours of meditation. What have you done? I am the greatest because I have a great master. I found the path earlier. How long have you been a follower? I have been so many years. This is terrible. Ego arising out of the very path which is supposed to cure ego. And there are others who say ego should be fought with a hammer. Break down your head if necessary. I am nobody. I am the worst sinner. Nobody was worse than me. I am the humblest of the humble. All the time inwardly believing, watching, have people recognized my humility? <laughs> and therefore, am I come out to emerge the winner? This is even worse ego. The ego of saying I am great is not so bad. Anybody can tell you you are not. But the ego of saying I am small, I am the worst, is a terrible ego. Nobody can tell you. All this is a game of ego. And to say I have love for people, I have love for country, I am going to do this, I, I, I. It is I that is prominent in all that kind of so-called love. But when real love comes, when love for someone overtakes you, suddenly, without your plan, without your mental game, you forget who you are. You get merged with the beloved. You identify with the beloved. The concerns of the beloved overtake you more than anything else. That's the only time you will find you've forgotten who I is. Love is the only experience in this world that takes away our ego. Therefore, love is the greatest assistance to meditation. Because ego comes in the way of our growth, spiritual growth. Love helps us by putting the ego on a shelf, at least for a while. And then we can proceed. Therefore, a life that we lead, day-to-day -day life of love, understanding, putting oneself in another, another's place, compassion. All these good diet, meditation, time, nice time schedule. All this helps in the growth of the awareness and the progress of the journey within. 
I'm making these points clear so lest you feel that it is only one time exercise that gives you all the results. If you are getting some benefit of this workshop, it's a sample, a small sampling of what is possible. Don't take this to be the real thing. With the sampling, get order for the whole thing. When you get a little sample, you taste it, you say, I like it. Then you order for the uh, main thing. So it is like that. If you like the sample, go for the whole thing. Now, are you ready for the exercise? We, we are trying to practice withdrawal of attention. There is an exercise which some of you have done called the orange juice experiment. Some people like it because it helps us to understand how attention can be moved in the body at will. That way it becomes easier to focus the attention behind the eyes. Is there anybody here who hasn't done the orange juice experiment? Please raise your hand. Out of others who have done it, would they like to do it again? Please raise your hand. Okay, we have near unanimity. Okay, you can. As an exception, don't suggest to others. It's too sticky. We are going to imagine. This is an exper experiment in imagination. We are going to imagine that this body, in which the process of uh, concentration of attention has to be used anyway in meditation. For the purpose of this next exercise, we are going to imagine that this body is made of glass, just like a hollow glass jar, and it is filled up with orange juice. We will imagine we are filling it up right to the top of the head with orange juice. We will also imagine that in our hands, in the fingertips, at the nails, where we have nails in the fingertips, we have valves. So when we press them like this, the valves open and the orange juice can flow out. If we don't, the orange juice stays back. So we fill up our body with orange juice. And when I give you instruction, then you press these fingernails so, and so watch the orange juice flowing. So the level of the orange juice falls. The attention always has to be on the level of the orange juice, not on what is happening to the valve. Similar valves exist in the toes, the nails of the toes. So when the orange juice falls below to the leg level, then you use the toes and ultimately the object will be to clear your body of all the orange. Quite clear? Uh, now close your eyes, assume you are made of glass. Now once you are made of glass, you can't move around too much, you will crack. To make the imagination realistic, imagine it's glass, it will crack if you do it. Now fill up the whole body with orange juice. Fill up the whole body right to the top of the head. Make sure the arms, the legs, the torso, the face, forehead, head, right to the top of the head, it's all full of orange juice. Go all over the body and make sure it is there. Now press and squeeze the valves in the hand, in the nails of the hand, fingers, so that some of the orange juice should slowly come out and the level of the orange juice in the head should drop to eye level. As soon as it drops to eye level, stop. Slowly, slow, slow, very slow drop by drop. Bring the orange juice down to the level of the eyes. When it comes to the eye level, stop and hold it there. Now gradually press the nails and get the orange juice to the nose level. When it comes to the tip of the nose, stop. Press again ever so gently and take it down to the level of the lips, the mouth and stop. See, it has cleared the ears, it has cleared the nose, cleared the eyes and come down to the level of the mouth and the jaws. And stop there, hold it there. Now press the valves again and let the orange juice level drop to the throat. When it reaches the throat level, stop. Now open the right side valves only of the right hand so that the orange juice starts flowing out only from the right arm. 
when it flows out up to the elbows, stop. Now take the left side, press the balls of the left hand and let the orange juice flow out from the left arm. When it reaches the elbow, stop. Now press both hands and let the orange juice flow from the arms till the orange juice is all out from both arms and both hands. Make sure it goes out of the finger. Shake the fingers if any orange juice is still there. Clear and watch that both arms are now empty. The head is all empty right up to the throat and the level has gone down below the armpits. And only the torso and the legs have the orange juice. Make sure. Now press the balls in the feet. Both feet press gently and take the or orange juice level to the level of the heart. When it reaches the heart level, stop. Press the valves in the feet again and take the orange juice to the level of the navel, in the middle of the intestines, the pit of the stomach at that level and stop there. Hold there. Watch it and control it. Hold. Now press the feet again. Let the orange juice flow so that the whole torso is vacated and orange juice is only in the legs. Clear up the rest of the body. Keep it only in the legs. Now press the valves again of the right leg and let the orange juice flow up to the knee level. When it comes to the right knee, stop. Now switch to the left leg and bring the level of the orange juice to the knee level. Open the valve. When it comes to knee level, stop. Now press both feet and let all the orange juice flow out of your body and the leg. Let it just flow out. Let it clear the body completely. Look at the whole body and shake part of it if you find that any orange juice is still sticking there. Look at the body, see where the orange juice is sticking. Shake that part and let all the drops of orange juice flow out from the hands and the feet. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three. Four, five, open your eyes. Good. Are you feeling clean or sticky? How many feeling clean? How many feeling sticky with orange juice? You did a good job, all of you. Did anyone have a difficulty in this experiment? Yes. A little tension there. Trying to control that emptying too fast. Any particular part or all, all the in the middle? Right? Oh. Did anybody have problem holding the orange juice at eye level? No. Anybody had problem holding the orange juice at nose, throat, in the arms, in the legs, in the stomach, at the abdominal level? You did pretty good. Yes. I started to drift away a little bit and had to pull my attention back when I hit that point. At, at, at yeah. the navel point? Yeah. That's where you also got... A little high around the heart. A little high around the heart. These, uh, yes. But when, you're, when you said leave the orange juice in your leg, then you say squeeze the orange juice out of your right leg. Uh, the orange juice from my left leg kept overflowing into my right leg as I'm sitting down. Okay. Yes, posture problem, huh? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Yes. I had a 
in a scuba diving outfit, oh, <laughs> sitting in the in the eye center. So when I started filling up with orange juice, then I imagined myself in a scuba diving outfit, you know. And then as the war as the orange juice started coming down, I started trading water at each point that was suggested we stop. And then down to the tip of the nose, I tread down to the throat. And I see myself swimming in this orange juice. And then when we finally get to the feet, uh, I realized that I was, you know, on the floor. And I just flew back up to the eye center. Is it a good experience? Was the rental scuba? <laughs> rental or own? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the idea of this exercise was to be able to control where we want to place our attention. And uh, not that the orange juice exercise takes us anywhere. It's just an aid, again an aid to practice of concentration of attention. And did, did anybody feel that the, when I said shake off all the orange juice, did any orange juice still stick behind in the bottle? Anybody had any drop sticking anywhere? Notes, yeah. And the feet. It wouldn't go. Any problem you have with the feet? Sometimes it happens when you have a problem, a physical problem, with any part of the body. You get uh, the feeling that it's difficult for the orange juice either to be held there or to move, and at the end of it, you still find some sticking there. Sometimes this exercise has been used for self-diagnosis, but which part of the body needs attention? And this orange juice can give you a key to that. Now we go back to the purpose for which this was done. The purpose is to be able to concentrate on being where you are, behind the eyes, which is the eye level. Now we'll do the experiment of the flowers and the pudding. Have you done that uh, experiment? How many of you have done that experiment, flowers and pudding? Thank you. How many have never done the experiment of flowers and pudding? Okay, quite a few newcomers. So we'll do it. The others can have a second helping. <laughs> In this exercise, which we are now about to do, we are trying to see if the sensory apparatus operates independently of the physical sense. We are used to visualization, that we close our eyes and we visualize. We are used to the tactile suggestion sometimes sit on a chair. But can we also equally well, through the process of imagination, practice the senses of taste and smell? If we can, then all the five senses can be reproduced at will behind the eyes. So that's the idea, to check it out. To check out this, the exercise we are about to do is to close our eyes, go to the third eye center and sit on our comfortable chairs, which we had acquired earlier. And now this time, on the right side of the chair, we place a vase of flowers and on a small dish beside it, a dessert or a snack of our choice. You can pick up any snack. Some people don't like sweet things, so I have added on this in the exercise. A salty snack if you wish. Otherwise, you can have a pudding of your choice. You have that on your plate. and when I say to you, pick up the flowers, you pick up the flowers, take them in front of you, look at the flowers, smell the flowers, and then put them back. When I say, pick up the dessert or the snack, then you pick up the snack, eat it, taste it, and then put it back. Quite clear? Now close your eyes in the same comfortable position. Comfort, but not sleepy, that position. Imagine you are in the center of the head behind the eyes, sitting on your comfortable chair, and on your right side is a table on which you have a vase of flowers, and next to it is a plate containing your snack. Now pick up the flowers, take them in front of you, look at them, and smell them. Take a deep breath and smell them so you know how they smell, the fragrance of the flowers. Now put the flowers back on the table. Now pick up the snack in the plate. Take it in front of you. Taste it. 
taste it once, twice. When you have recognized the taste, put it back on the table. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this side. How many of you saw the flowers? How many of you smelt the flowers? How many of you did not see the flowers? How many of you did not smell the flowers? How many of you saw the snack? How many of you tasted the snack? How many of you did not see or taste the snack? How many of you saw flowers which you have not seen before? Yeah, what kind of flowers? Huge orange flowers. You not seen anything like this? No, not that full. But th were those the flowers you wanted to imagine, or? Uh, I tried not to want to imagine everything when I did it. I tried to like look at whatever you want. Did they have any smell or fragrance? What flowers did you see? Yeah, like I was discovering the pattern of the butterfly. When you put them on the table, they changed. Okay. Did anybody have a, a flower smelling so unusual you haven't smelled that before? Any strange smelling flowers? What about the pudding? Did you get your favorite puddings? What did you uh, taste? What did you taste? Oh, I had strawberries with like a shine coconut on top. It was good. Enough. Did it really taste good? Yeah. Anybody else tasted strawberries? Well, let's go back to that again and have yours. That sounds great. Uh, yes. A question. Can yes. you eat eggs? <laughs> Why did custard pudding? It had eggs in it. <laughs> oh my God. So you didn't eat for that reason? You don't. No, I tasted it. It's been a long time since I had custard pudding, so it was something that I uh, I enjoyed the taste of it for a long time. You mean there was a repressed desire for that? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay. okay, many of these things come up from our own memories, from our own subconscious desires. Some of them come from simple day-to-day -day memories of a few days ago, but some of these come without that. That was not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise was that in consciousness, in this power of imagination, what we call, we have the power not only to imagine and see something, we have the power to taste and smell and touch. All the senses are uh, intact in the power of imagination. So when we say we have an astral body or a sensory body, it is not a body. The astral or sensory body is just the sense perceptions by themselves able to move away from the physical. And we call it. Yes, it is just as real, it's more real than the body. It's more real than this body. It fits into this body and makes this body real. Just because it is fitting into this body, it makes this body real. When, it's, when this body dies, that still lives. The same sensory body still lives and can still use the same senses. So this is just an experiment to show that we have the power of imagination extending to all our sensory perceptions which in turn are creating this universe for us. This universe is being created by these sensory perceptions. I, in the beginning, talked about mantra. Mantra is words which you can use in order to stop thoughts which take you wandering away. Many of you said that when you want to sit behind the eyes, the thoughts take you away. Mantra is a repetition of those bland words which makes you hold still there. Because you keep on repeating those words. Now, those of you who have a mantra, please repeat your mantra in the next exercise. And those who do not have, please coin a temporary mantra for today. The temporary mantra is to choose a short phrase expressing love for the beloved. A short phrase expressing love for your beloved and keep on repeating it at a moderate speed, not rushing through, not very slow. At a moderate speed, you repeat the same phrase over and over again. This will be a temporary mantra. When you are sitting there and repeating these words, you will be really occupying the mind in this 
and reducing the chances of the mind running out. In addition to that, if any images come in front of you and they distract you, if they don't distract you, let them pass, let them go, you keep on repetition. If any images come and they distract you, don't let you stay there, then you deliberately by the imaginative process imagine or contemplate the face of the beloved, the face of your master if you have one, a guru or your beloved and that face you fix in front of you by contemplation and if the contemplation is strong enough to hold you there, fine. If not, use a combination with the repetition of the words and the contemplation. If during this process at any time the sound comes and is audible and you can hear it, leave everything else and listen to the sound and see how the sound pulls you within. This is an exercise in which you can use all these different aids in order to be at the third eye center and drawn to yourself. Quite clear? You close your eyes and commence. Begin. Five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes and decide. Did you like this exercise? How many of you enjoyed it? Good, we passed. How many of you did not like it? No failures. How many of you had still difficulty in being at the third eye center behind? You had difficulty. Yes, you'd like to share the difficulty? Well, I concentrated on the mantra and a visual, it looked like a photograph, and after all, I kept seeing other photographs of the same person at different times of their lives, and then for some reason, I was on a sea scene, I saw an island in the distance, and a huge warship come by, on our way up here, I saw something like that on the, on the train route. But it wasn't exactly the same scene, but I guess that I figured it out. And I went, and I started to try to, I heard it sort of ring, so I thought it might be a sound. I stayed with it for a little while, but it, the thought wasn't positive, so I went back to the mantra and the visual, original picture I had. But the whole, uh, whole experience was ple pleasant? Yes, I didn't say there was any unpleasant part. I drifted more than I wanted. I right. was the only okay. Just a little I drifting. Okay. Yes, you had. Um, drifting, but when I try to use a mantra, and I did, and I did continue to use it, I feel a tension in my throat as though my vocal cords are trying to say the mantra. And I find that just distracting. But I did stay with that mantra, and it seemed to fade, and I did, a face did come into my view, and I put that stayed fairly, fairly steady. I mean, there were thoughts drifting, but, but the, the mantra is still not comfortable. I don't right. know. When the mantra is spoken from the tongue, or the mouth, or the throat, it is not comfortable. No. Nor is it the right way to do it. So if this happens, that the mantra, instead of being repeated mentally by the mind, takes root in the throat or the tongue or the mouth, and the tongue seems to move along with it or the throat seems to give rise to it, then independently of this exercise, you should practice creating a sound different than the mantra from the throat. Ah, some sound. And then repeating the mantra mentally on top of it. Make this sound loud and the mantra in the head. After a little practice, the mantra will become mental and this sound will not be there. So, mantra will shift from the throat into the head. You can try that. Yeah, I will. It sounds, yeah. sounds like white, the white music is probably... Exactly. Color. It is like that. You put a different sound here and the mantra shifts to the mind because in good meditation, the mind alone should do the mantra. The mind alone should speak the words of the mantra and not the mouth, not the tongue, not the throat. Uh, any other question? Yes. I don't feel like I'm back far enough when I close my eyes and try to be in the center. Push the floor. I'll try that. Put, put rollers or wheels under your chair. 
put wheels under your chair and push and you will feel it going back and stay there. If it goes forward, push again. You have to go further back. Where you are is too close to the ice. Yeah, sure. You have to move further back. Wow, this... <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's almost like, almost like I can't push the chair back. I feel like there's just resistance even for me. If you see something in front of you that you can push, such as eyelids, even with the hands, you can push the eyelids and move back. When you close your eyes, you feel the eyelids are there, with the inner hand, push and then go backward. You have to center. If you're too much in front, you don't get the all the views that we are talking about. And then I feel like my eyes are, maybe I'm straining my eyes to like go back or something. Yeah. That's the other point. There should be no strain on the eyes and no strain on the head and no strain on the body. This exercise is imaginative and done with the mind and doesn't involve the body. So if the body is being burdened with any stress or strain, look at it and figure out why you are putting the strain on the body. You are doing it because you are still trying to make this body come into there. And that's not the idea. This body is not to be brought in. This body is the house. We are inside this body and the imaginative body has to do the exercise. Try and overcome this. Yes. So the question I asked last night about the question that I had in Rochester, Minnesota about the vision of the master from the eye level in the forehead. I didn't understand what you said in Rochester about that. Oh, I, now I can answer that. <laughs> if I don't answer now, it will have to be in the next workshop. <laughs> I had mentioned that the mind, mind can make any face it likes. Normally, we assume that the mind can contemplate on any imaginary face. But the perfect living masters who have themselves in their consciousness attained the state above the mind, they get a little protection even in their physical form in the sense that a mind, anybody's mind, cannot reproduce the whole of that face. The eyes and the forehead, that part of the face of a perfect living master, cannot be reproduced by the mind. So if you try to think of that face, if your mind is making it up, it will clutter up. The rest of the face will remain, but this portion will clutter up, shake up, and not be there. This is one of the tests. People want to apply a test. That is, it, is the mind making it up or is it real? When it is really there, during meditation, when you feel you have really been able to establish the form of your master, then the forehead and the eyes will be stable and will be just like you have seen in the physical form. If that happens, you can talk to that master, get your question answered, and you are actually in the company of the master. He is there. But if your mind is making it up, and this part is not clear. Don't ask any questions because your own mind will give the answer. Yes. Any other question? Are you saying if your mind is making it up, then this part is not clear? That's right. And if it's clear, then... And your mind is not making it up. It the master up. is helping you. But, and you but, can assume that, it, uh, that he is a per the person is a perfect master. And you can make that assumption. No. <laughs> <laughs> because... Because you can get this form of any other person. <laughs> it is not easy to find out who is a perfect living master. It's very difficult. When he reveals himself, he reveals in a strange way to his marked sheep. And there are so many methods in which he reveals. But when we are ready, if we are ready in our heart, we do come across a perfect living master. It is not that we can at any time find him. Because we, we may not be ready, we won't find him. He won't reveal. We may pass by him every day. And when we are ready, he reveals. And there are a lot of uh, other signs that go with when you meet the perfect living master. But one of the best is he will meet you by coincidence when you are ready. When we are ready in our heart, we meet the perfect living master. He appears in our life by coincidence. Any other question? Now we... I am concluding this uh, workshop for today and these were just samplings that you got and the purpose of this was to be able to go within your own self, to know that the direction is right. Remember on the spiritual path, 
going within is the right direction. Going outside is the wrong direction. It doesn't take too long to know whether you are in the right direction or wrong direction. You may go slow. You may go fast. But if you are in the right direction, you will reach the destination. If one wants to go in this direction, goes to the opposite direction, you are going further away. But if you start going in the right direction, even if you go slow, you will one day reach. So if you remember that the right direction for the spiritual journey is within yourself, whatever steps you take to go within will lead you to your destination and is the correct thing to do. So I would like to give you my best wishes on the spiritual path and the spiritual journey and hope that those of you who are already initiated by a perfect living master will make good this great initiation and the power of meditation it gives you. Those who are not initiated by a perfect living master, but have some initiation, will make use of their initiation to reach a point when the perfect living master suddenly appears to them. And those who have never been initiated by their intense seeking and readiness inside will come to the coincidence of meeting a perfect living master. Thank you very much. God bless you. Goodbye.